Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, my name is Craig Maxwell. I'm the chapter chair for the Southern Piedmont chapter at North Carolina Native Plant Society. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, and so we have Sean Bloom with us here today. He's the GIS director and a biologist for the Catawba Lands Conservancy. He's been with them since 2011. Uh, and he works on mapping and geographical analysis of the Catawba Lands Conservancy and the Carolina Thread Trail. And he's also working on the Catawba Grasslands Project, which he will talk to us about today. Um, so, Sean Bloom. Thank you all for having me today. So, as Craig noted, um, I'm here to talk about the Catawba Grasslands Project. A little bit more about me. I went, I uh, attended school up in Salisbury, Catawba College. Um, and I've worked for Catawba Lands Conservancy, like I said, for about 12 years. Before that, I did environmental consulting, and I was also a park ranger for a few years. Uh, but probably the best thing about uh, best thing about me is I'm also Mandy Bloom's husband. So. <laughs> you got some points. <laughs> Talbot Project. Who here thinks this is what North Carolina should look like? Yeah. You can raise your hand if you think so. Okay. Um, there's a story that before um, Columbus and before European uh, colonization, a squirrel could go, tell me if you've heard this, um, a squirrel could go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River and never touch the ground. Because the idea was that the canopy was closed from coast to river. But in reality, um, the Carolinas had a large amount of grasslands uh, across the hilltops and even some of the uh, river bottoms as well. Um, and in this area, our grasslands generally break up into three categories. The Piedmont prairies, which have been open grasslands uh, with very few trees or shrubs. Then you would have had uh, pine, oak, savannas. Um, you can think of the coastal plain and the longleaf pine savannas. Um, that would have been an example of this. And then woodlands. So the canopy is not closed. It is an open canopy, so there's enough light getting down to the forest floor so that you uh, see a lot of uh, grasses and wildflowers. I, I would say two great examples of a woodland in the Piedmont Prairie. If you go to Lada Plantation, um, they have done a terrific job up there of recreating these Piedmont Prairies and pine oak savannas or woodlands. This is an example of the Piedmont Prairie. This is at Buffalo Creek Preserve in Cabarrus County. Um, it's about 25 acres in size. And this is a site that Catawba Lands Conservancy owns and maintains through prescribed fire. Example here of a pine oak savanna. This is actually at Red Layer, which is over in Gasson County. It's another site that uh, CLC conserves in partnership with the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. You can see uh, canopy is not closed, but you still have a large number, a number of trees in there, but you still have a good component of grasses and wildflowers. And then this would be a woodland grassland. Uh, this is actually out in the Uari Mountains. Um, so the, the soils there are very rocky, does not allow for great root penetration. So you have these you know, smaller stunted trees. Um, again, open canopy, so there's still lots of light coming down to the forest floor. And then the fourth one that I didn't mention, um, it's kind of, it's fairly rare here in the Carolinas, are these granitic flat rocks. Um, if anyone's been down to Atlanta and to the Georgia area, they have a lot of these granitic flat rock sites. Um, Stone Mountain um, down there is an example. Uh, but we are actually working to conserve one of these granitic flat rocks here in the Carolinas. It's actually up in Lincoln County. Um, this is 40, from that site. 40 acre park, is that a granitic? 40 acre is another great example. Yes, thank you. So it's not just me who's saying that there's grasslands. There's a, an entire um, historical record of the presence of these grasslands. Um, and I'm coming from it from a GIS map perspective. Um, that's what I know is maps. And I'll show you some examples where we have maps from the early colonialization time um, and ex exploration time of America that still that reference grasslands or savannas. So this map going all the way back to 1672 um, where was it? I'm so mixed up here now. That's no <laughs> It says grasslands in there, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one is from John Lawson. Um, and well, I don't have presentation, but um, 
if you're not familiar with John Lawson, he was the surveyor general uh, for the King of England, surveyed the Carolinas. And actually in one of his writings, as he's traveling through the Salisbury, uh, Lexington area, writes that he, I traveled many miles this day across high, uh, high and good land with very few trees, it's describing this pine oak savanna. And that's depicted in his map here um, with the trees sparsely spread apart to indicate this is a sparsely tree. Uh, map of 1718, and you can see in the Piedmont region, the Grand Savannah. And even some of our own place names reference buffalo, elk, cane breaks, grassy creek. So even the place names indicate that you know, this is where you could find elk, this is where you could find buffalo. Over in Cabarrus County, you've got the Dutch Buffalo and Irish Buffalo Creek. Buffalo were there. This is where the Dutch settled and the Irish settled. So it's the Irish Buffalo Creek. Uh, cane Creek, where uh, you would have had great expanses of cane breaks. Um, you know, our floodplains, some of them still would have been highly wooded, but some of them would have been expanses of uh, a river cane. And even going up into uh, Catawba County, you've got Elk Shoal Creek. So you had elk coming down this far. Um, if you've driven the Blue Ridge Parkway, there is an actual note there of uh, Bull Creek Valley, which is the last known location of a buffalo in North America, in North Carolina, sorry. Um, these would have been different buffalo though, or different bison. They would not have been the large bison from the uh, uh, Great Plains. These would have been woodland bison which is a smaller animal, um, but still big enough, it would push over uh, small trees and saplings to help keep that clear uh, land open. A lot of our grasslands were also maintained, not just by buffalo and elk, but also by Native Americans. Um, in our region, primarily the Catawba and the Cherokee nations, uh, they would have used historical fire practices to burn and keep areas open. So here's a map showing you the extent, the historical extent of elk. So even to the late uh, 1700s, we had them here in the Carolinas. So what has happened to those grasslands? Um, primarily three things have contributed to the loss of our grasslands. One, it, well, let's go back into time. Um, conversion of grasslands to farm. Some of our early settlers here, they would have come to these dry open ridges, nice flat open grassy areas really easy to farm. So a lot of our grasslands got converted into farmland fairly quickly. Um, they're also high, dry, and level, so they make great places to build roads. So some of our earliest roads would have followed through these grasslands. Highway 29 is a great example, uh, which is, um, oh, what was that called? The Great Trading Path, the Great Trading Path, Highway 29, um, which now 85 follows. Um, it would have been high, dry, great for road construction, development, farming. Then you have urban sprawl. So again, flat and open, easiest place to build homes, easiest place to build cities. And so we've continued, we've gradually lost these uh, grasslands due to those uh, contributing factors. Uh, farmland conversion, urban sprawl, highway development, but also the biggest one is probably fire suppression. Um, we had fires coming through this area every two to five years. So what have we lost because of our loss of grasslands? Uh, I believe it was it was E.O. Wilson. I'm going to get the quote wrong. Um, but E.O. Wilson wrote that the southeastern grasslands were one of the biggest biodiversity locations on the globe. And we've lost 90% of those grasslands. And with it, Loss of habitat for 560 different species of native bees, uh, 174 moths or butterflies, over 2,000 moths, and even flies, which are important. And it's also important because all these that I just noted here, they're extremely important for agriculture and for fruit production. Um, so many of our bees are critical for um, pollinating apples, um, okra. Uh, I could just a whole list of things. I don't know why those two came to mind. But uh, interesting thing, flies. Flies are important for pollination because what do flies pollinate? Lots of pawpaws, yeah. 
that's the big one that they're known for. Um, pawpaws are pollinated by flies. But what we've also lost is uh, the rusty patch, rust, rusty patch bumblebee. Um, it's now listed as endangered. We do now have an endangered bumblebee. Um, it was known to come all the way down here into the Carolinas, primarily the foothills in Appalachia, but uh, they did. There have been records of them here in the Charlotte area. Now they're primarily isolated to the upper Midwest. Monarch butterfly decline. Uh, we're now down to 84% from a hive in 1996. Um, a lot of that is considered due to the uh, use of pesticides in um, industrial farming practices, because what it does is it removes the milkweed, which is that they have to have milkweed in order to reproduce. Songbirds. Um, Eastern meadowlark, which was once very common across this area, is now almost unheard of. Bobwhite quail. The, uh, oh, smallest falcon. Who can, who can remember? Thank you, American kestrel is now in decline. Um, and it's very rare. Um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Northern shrikes, another grassland bird, um, which is very rare in our region now. And then native plants. 60% um, of our native plants are actually full sun, partial shade. They like grassland habitats, they like savanna habitats. Um, and two thirds of the listed species here in the Charlotte area are grassland obligates. It's gonna be Schwannet sunflowers, Michaud sumac, um, smooth, smooth purple, smooth cone flower, um, and even Georgia aster, which isn't listed, but it's listed by the state. These are all grassland plants. These are all Piedmont prairie plants and they're endangered. So Catawba Grasslands Project. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking to enhance, create and restore grasslands here in the Charlotte region again. And then we've done that across 10 projects or 10 properties across five counties. I'm, a, I'm not gonna go through all 10, but I'm gonna highlight some of the uh, major ones. But uh, before I do that, I'm going to talk about the ways that we manage these grassland habitats. Um, primarily, the two big, well, the three big ones are prescribed fire, mechanical understory thinning, and bush hogging. Uh, we prefer prescribed fire, but we'd also do bush hogging and sometimes understory thinning. Prescribed fire. I know this looks scary, but there's a good reason for that. So with bush hogging, the reason we do bush hogging, although it's not preferred, um, talked about buffalo and elk earlier. They are grazers. No, sorry. They are grazers and just have the term in my head. Browsers. Browsers, thank you. Yeah, they are grazers. So they are grazers. Um, they're going to go through, mow down the grass, mow down the vegetation, keep it all low, and allow for that, re uh, that regrowth. Whereas browsers, they're looking to mostly chew off on um, new growth, leafy, you know, leaves off of low hanging shrubs and trees. They, they're getting, they're impacting the environment in two different ways. With the loss of buffalo and elk, we no longer have any grazers. We only have browsers. That's why when you look through a forest, all you see is a line about oh, this high, no vegetation because it's all been browsed and the deer can't reach anything higher. And so we use bush hogging as an alternative since we don't have any grazers in our ecosystem. What exactly does bush hogging do? It simulates grazing and that just, it mows everything down. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the disadvantage though with, great, with bush hogging is that with a grazer, they're consuming it and then depositing it elsewhere. With bush hogging, you're just cutting it and laying it right on top. And so you get a thick layer of thatch. Um, so you either have to burn it, try to drum chop or um, till it somehow um, to make it work really well. But it is, it's, it's an option that we do have. For an understory thinning, um, this is primarily done in areas where we have a lot, where we might have either purchased or inherited a loblolly pine plantation. Um, and we will go through and uh, thin that loblolly pine beyond what you normally would do for production because what we're looking to do is really stimulate that forest floor, get a lot of sunlight down there. And so that is an option for us is understory thinning. Um, we've also done this, well, I'll, I'll get into that in another project a little bit later. 
And then of course, prescribed fire. This is the best thing for us to do um, because what it does is it releases a lot of those nutrients that are caught in um, dry material. So all the brown grass right now, when we burn it, it releases that nutrients back into the soil. It also stimulates the growth. Um, many of our plants are accustomed to and have evolved to survive fire. So our grasses, they'll have all of their growth um, down below the thatch layer. So as the fire goes over the top of it, it doesn't actually singe the growing portion. It's been protected. So that once that fire's um, gone through the area, it'll just green right up. There's even some many spe uh, seed species that need fire. They're serotonous. Um, you can think of shortleaf pine, table mountain pine, um, pitch pine. Those are all serotonous cones. They actually have to have fire for the cones to open up and release their seed. So that we do have some plants, uh, Schwannet sunflower, there's a study uh, that if exposed to the ash uh, from a fire, it increased their um, germination rate by about 30%. So it's, it, fire is important for these species. The good old Smokey the Bear. Good old Smokey the Bear. Only you can prevent forest fires. Um, I wish we could move that graphic, but uh, what this map here is showing you, I mentioned earlier that we had about a two to five year burn rotation here in the Carolinas. And that's just not me saying it. It's a whole list of scientists uh, up across the top there who did a study of burn frequencies. They were looking at tree rings um, as one data set. So they'd take a tree core and they could actually see historically where those singe marks were in the tree core and were able to calculate the burn rotation for our areas. And so we are in that um, two to four, two to five year range. Why is fire important? It's important for habitat, but also for us, it's a great way of uh, reducing fuels. Um, if you have a controlled fire, then you get to decide how hot it's gonna be, how intense, how long it's gonna burn, and it goes through and it will burn away all that um, material on the forest floor that could contribute to a wildfire. Um, prescribed fire does take a lot of planning. It's not just that we wake up one morning and say, oh gosh, I really wanna burn something, let me go light a match. I'm going to go take up smoking for a day. Um, it takes a lot of planning. Um, you're looking at not just what's in the immediate area, but, you know, are there homes nearby? Is there a, we've actually had to adjust our um, prescriptions based on chicken coops and cattle farms, which were, you know, quarter mile away. Because the last thing you want to do is have a whole bunch of smoke go through a chicken coop or have it go through a place with cattle because it's going to start with cattle. Um, so you look at what's around the area, what your fuel types are because different fuels will burn under different conditions. So if I have a really heavy fuel, lots of wood, lots of down trees, lots of branches, I need it to be much drier in order for that to burn. But at the same time, that increases the risk of a fire getting, getting out of hand. So you gotta weigh those things. Um, sometimes some Buffalo Creek Preserve, we may have wanted to burn and could have, but because the fuels were so heavy, we have to wait for it to get so dry that to do a fire threat area would not have been responsible. So we actually had to go and drum chop it first to break it up, make it smaller so that we could burn under better conditions. Um, and this is what it'll look like afterwards. Uh, this is a couple of my teammates, Ashton and Raul, um, who helped with this fire. This is, a, uh, again, at Buffalo Creek Preserve. It's an interesting story here on this field. Um, it was a, they had a lot of great native grasses and um, some really good wildflowers in there. It was used for hay production. And then the landowner converted it to row crops for about two to three years. Realized it was too steep for row crops. And then it was like, ah, oh, well, I'll give up on row crops and then they go fallow. Well, because he'd already treated it to get rid of the seed bank so he could grow his crops. Now it's coming in with Johnson grass and fescue and other things. So we're trying to use fire and other methods to try to get this to go back over to that great grass and site that it was. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about some of our projects now. Buffalo Creek Preserve, um, like I said, up in Cabarrus County, little story here. Um, it's about a 400 acre site. It was mostly farmland and the family uh, had sold it to a developer. And then I think they sold it to them in about 2006, 2007. And it was slated to have 400 acres. So it's slated to have 500 homes on it. Um, they actually began um, clearing the land. 
And there was about 80 acres that was a uh, mature hardwood forest that they had completely cleared as a residential clear cut. Then we rolled into 2008, the Great Recession hits. No one wants to buy 500 ac 400 acres to put 500 homes in Midland, North Carolina, <laughs> an hour, 40, 30 to 40 minutes outside of Charlotte. So um, the developer actually went bankrupt and we managed to receive that property um, in that process. So 400 acres now permanently conserved. We've got about 120 of it in active agriculture. Uh, we started working on the 80 acre clear cut to do uh, grassland, uh, uh, pine oak savanna. We will that down now to about 25 acres just because we realized that 80 acres was a lot to manage after a clear cut. And the reason we did that, um, and we're doing it with, great, with a lot of great partners. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service provided a lot of expertise. North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, Plant Conservation Program, Botanical Garden, Friends of Plant Conservation Program. And I'll mention why they are all involved. So this is what we actually, this is what it looked like when we received the property after that clear cut. That's a lot of material to try to run fire through. The first time we did, it took us nine hours and everyone was so mad because it just wouldn't carry the fire. So we're having to constantly walk through all that with drip torches. Um, um, but this is what it looked like um, in 2021. You can see there's a lot, I mean, that it was beautiful when we took this photo because the whole landscape was covered with uh, golden ragwort. Just looked terrific after the fires. Why did we do this? Um, when we first received the property initially, we noticed that there was already some interesting grassland plants out there. We were seeing some Indian grass growing up, um, a little bit of blue stem, um, but we also had slender leaf mountain mint already growing out there. We started seeing black eyed Susans popping up. Um, there's also this plant here off to the left, left side for y'all. This is um, golden top, which is a coastal plain species. It is not normally found here in the Piedmont, but we had a population pop up in the middle of this savanna site. And then I think it, Laura, what, three years ago now? I think so, yeah. Yeah, Laura was out there walking and she came across this plant on the far right. And that is Lotus helleri is a state listed species that had not been known to this area. Laura found the first uh, population. <laughs> okay, and I'll tell you, that was really exciting because that told that was after we'd have done bush chop, uh, not bush hog, um, drum chopping, two applications with triclopyr to try to get rid of some of the woody vegetation and three birds. And for that plant to finally emerge, told me, okay, this is the right, we're doing the right management in the right area because that is an obligate uh, Piedmont prairie species. It has to have open grasslands to survive. The other thing that told us that, that this was the right area, there were three known populations of Schwannitz's sunflower within about two mile, one and a half to two mile radius of the site. So we, we knew the soil types were there. Um, so we were really excited about that project. Then two years ago, finally, 10 year process to get that site to a condition where um, it was actually a grassland. Um, we worked with the North Carolina Botanical Garden and Plant Conservation Program to do to create the first ever recovery site for Schweinitz sunflower in Cabarrus County. Um, we collected seed from those roadside populations, sent them up to the Botanical Garden where they propagated 800 seedlings for us. And then we planted them out in the fall of, this is 2023, so 2021, we planted them in the fall of 2021. Um, bad news, good news. The following year, we did a census, 800, we planted 800 out there. The next year, we only found 118. It's a high mortality, but the issue was we planted them. We had been getting rain that year. We planted them. Of course, what happens when you plant something? It stops, yeah, you had a drought. And we did, we had about two to three weeks where we did not have any rain. Um, but then this year we went out, so we had 118. This year we went out, we had 160 plants. Mm -hmm. And in some, in one area, it was, it tripled in um, population size. So I think we had a initial die off of mortality because of that drought, but they are recovering. I'm really excited by this site, what the, what the potential is out there. This led to what we now call the, uh, the power and pollinators project. 
Um, that started out at uh, Pin Hook Preserve over in Gaston County. This is a site, it was a uh, utility right of Duke Energy right of way that uh, one of the neighboring landowners was using as um, hunting grounds. So he was maintaining this uh, short bit of right of way um, by bush hogging off schedule and then also planting um, food plots out there. Duke Energy had not touched this site in decades. And it's because it's on a peninsula where the South Fork River wraps around and it's about a mile long dirt road to get down to it for like a half mile section. Duke just wasn't interested and it was already being maintained by the uh, landowners in the area. So like, ah, yeah, sure, do what you want to do. Um, this is what it looked like in, back in 2009. Again, kept it mowed, he kept it mowed down in the summertime. He had food plots out there. The person who was doing this um, passed away and actually CLC owns this property now. So we're like, well, let's just maintain this naturally. No more food plots, no more mowing. We're going to maintain this naturally. So this is the first year when we're not mowing it. We're not using any herbicide. We're just mowing it now in the late fall, letting it grow up through the summer. We haven't added anything to the seed bank, but this is just what is there. That's the following year. Kind of an explosion of sunflowers out there. And then we find out there's a whole huge population of spotted bee bomb. Um, Biden. So we've got spotted bee bomb out there. We have got a native population of um, cactus. Um, yeah, prickly pear cactus down there. Um, butterfly weed. And there's no schwannets. I've checked every single year. There's a couple of plants that still give me. It's the microcephalus that always gets me, but just an explosion of wildflowers were already in the seed bank that we just let come up naturally. Building on that success, um, we then went to what we call Stanley Creek Forest, which is in another portion of Gaston County. Highway, old Highway 27 runs through the middle of this 1,500-acre uh, conservation area, and there's a number of uh, smaller transmission lines uh, that run through it. So we reached out to Duke Energy and said, listen, will you let us maintain the right of way how we want to and not come through here, spray, not mow it? And they said, sure. And they actually provided fund the initial funding. And so with that initial funding, we did go through there and spray because a lot of it was fescue um, or um, I'm not going to say non-desirable, but uh, annual weedy natives, um, things that did not uh, provide a lot of uh, um, seeds or, or nectar. So we went through and sprayed it. And then we went back and seeded the whole right of way area um, with a blend of native wallflower seeds. So we went from you know about a two to three acre site to now we're managing 10 acres of right away through Stanley Creek. We put in no mow, no mow, no spray signs. NCDOT doesn't listen great. Duke Energy has been wonderful though. Um, <laughs> but you can see what's all coming up already. So with that, so now we've we got two acres under our belt with just working with the native seed bank. Then we did 10 acres of maintaining it right away and seeding it. And we're maintaining that right away now. We went to Duke Energy and say, hey, listen, can you help us out here? These grassland sites, your right of way, your right of ways have been terrific sites for grassland plants. Can you work with us? Uh, we worked with their right, right of way manager and some of the executives at Duke, and they were really excited by this idea, actually. And so they, they signed up and said, you know, yeah, we, we can look at a project. So Met, Eastern Mecklenburg County, there's a large transmission line from Mountain Island Lake um, going down uh, south. Basically, it follows Bellamy Road where the Whitewater Center is. Is that fam starting to familiar? Okay. Uh, Shuffletown Prairie, which is a Mecklenburg County site. So from Shuffletown Prairie up to what we call the Catawba Wallflower Glen, where we have Georgia Aster. And then following down along the river through another Mecklenburg County site, the Riverside Drive Park. It's a future park through the Whitewater Center, and then down to Iswa Nature Preserve. So this corridor of right of ways, so we've got um, Georgia Aster, Schwinet Sunflower, and Smooth Coneflower, um, all growing at different places along this right of way. Duke Energy agreed. They were no longer going to do broadcast spraying. Um, what they did, though, they still did herbicide. Can't blame them for that. But what they did is they had the contractors go through with backpack sprayers, 
to do targeted spraying, basal spray treatments on woody uh, trees and shrubs. The first year, it was a pain and it was slow form. Uh, by their third year, they were using less herbicide and completing the work quicker than in their traditional broadcast spray. And so they're really, can, they're seeing the benefits of this. By using targeted spraying, they're using less material and less time. So they're actually looking at other places where they can continue to do this targeted spraying rather than uh, broadcast spraying. The next thing we, yeah. And there anything, um, I this is exciting. Yeah. But anyway, is there anything that's being done or are there hopes that the smooth sunflower might move through? I mean, you know, because that moment I is very isolated. There's hardly any, right? Yes, there. yeah. And um, I wonder if that may establish a corridor or if y'all are doing anything or plant conservation is doing anything to try to extend the smooth sunflower. Yeah, so Lisa asked, um, this is for the Zoom folks, um, is with the with this project, especially up at Shelfetown Prairie where the smooth coneflower is located, is if this work um, is going to allow for the expansion of that smooth coneflower or if there's any work to intentionally expand its range. And I don't know, um, I don't think, I will say, I don't think this work is going to cause smooth coneflower to start flourishing up and down the corridor. Um, I think one of the issues is that it can be slow to germinate or have difficulty spreading. Um, there might be efforts in the future, though, working at this site specifically to maybe do something similar at Buffalo Creek, where they collect seed, propagate it, and then replant it elsewhere. That's a possibility. Yeah. Um, it would be really interesting if anyone, like maybe a student or anything, could document, you know, in the first few years what species are there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know there's been links. Um, between electric power and potential cancer and mutations and stuff, it would be interesting if we started seeing odd cultivars come up along through there. Yeah, you know, if someone like watches that over the next few years to see if we see an increase in mutations or in uh, plant changes. That would be interesting. Absolutely. Okay. Fully preserve. Um, this is up in Lincoln County. Uh, and this is now, we are really digging into this pro this grasslands project. Uh, we purchased this property from a family. Uh, it has about 30 acres that were in active ag agriculture. Uh, the difficulty was, is a hobby farm. So weed management was iffy. Um, but some of it was uh, fescue grass that was uh, mowed for hay. Some of it was alternating row crops and then let fallow a couple times. Um, but it's an exciting project. So we're going to try to convert this 30 acres of agricultural land to grasslands. Um, already we've seen eastern uh, meadowlarks. We've heard quail out there. We do know there is a population in northern shrike just down the road um, because we have conservation easements through this area. Monitored one of them about five years ago, and they have a whole bunch of barbed wire fencing. And as I was walking out, I noticed, oh, there's a bowl. Another bowl, a mouse of cricket. And it was like out of a scene out of a horror movie. Just all these insects and rodents impaled all up and down. I was like, that's a northern shrike. That is what they do. Uh, so I was really excited that, oh my gosh, we have northern shrikes in this area. So we're also doing, so 2017 is on this side um, before we started work. And then 2022, after we did some initial seeding, um, came back the first year with a large amount of wing stem and uh, crown beard which, hey, that's a, it's a pollinating species. Um, it's great for nectar. Low diversity, though, but we're excited about it. We at least got a response of native uh, plants coming up. Unfortunately, what we also had a huge response of was bull thistle and Canadian thistle. And somehow we managed to convince about 10 folks to come out and volunteer with us for one day. And uh, because we weren't going to be able to hit it soon enough, it was going to bolt. It already bolted. Um, some of them had already gone to flower, and they were just about ready to go to fruit. So we convinced volunteers to help us out, wear long sleeve shirts and gloves, and cut those seed heads. So we did not have a um, did not contribute to that seed bank. Um, that is one thing we're going to be fighting out here at this site is the thistle and the Johnson grass. But already we're seeing results. Uh, we've got nesting uh, ground nesting birds out there. We actually had um, a gentleman who's no longer doing it right now. His health has failed, um, but he was actually out there doing mist netting um, and cataloging bird species. Um, and the hope was that we're going to try to work with some else, someone else 
we want to see if we can notice a change in bird species composition as we move away from an agricultural field to a high quality grassland site. Jackson Blackjack down in Union County. This is a site that I'm really excited about. There you go, Lisa. <laughs> so the site is a, uh, a Zarek hardpan forest. And what that means, first of all, if that's a globally rare habitat type. There's probably only about 15 to 20 known Zarek hardpans um, in the world. And most of them are centered here in the Charlotte, Carolina region. The interesting thing about uh, Zarek hardpans is the soil. It's a shrink swell soil. And so when it's dry, it shrinks and gets really cracky. But as soon as it rains, it instantly swells and almost is impenetrable. So water is not able to actually percolate through that soil very well. So it's dry, it's very dense soil. Uh, root penetration for a lot of our oak trees is not very good. And so you end up with stunted small trees. Um, historically, there would have been a lot of fire through here just because of the dryness. And so it would have been an open canopy. Um, this site also, there was known populations, again, of prairie species. Schwannet sunflower is about 500 feet down the road from this site. We're just like, fuck <laughs> um, Also, again, the uh, lotus helleri, uh, Carolina birdfoot trefoil. It, just uh, about 10,000 plants of this growing up and down um, Potter Road um, at this site here. And behind it uh, is um, Michelle Eye, um, Barber's Button. Um, there's a population of Barber's Button out there. Um, leopard's Bane. So you can thankfully, you now know there are no leopards in Union County <laughs> because we've got Leopard Bane growing there to keep them out. <laughs> there's also a fox squirrels grow, uh, living here at Jackson Black Jack Preserve. Um, I was really surprised. I was like, what is that? Really dark squirrel? That oh, that's a fox squirrel. <laughs> so I was really excited that we have a, net, we have a population of fox squirrels out there. Okay. Uh, a little bit more about that site. So uh, we're looking to, again, introduce fire. It's about 25 acres. Um, there's also liatris, a whole bunch of liatris growing out there too, which is really beautiful. Um, went through this spring and did basal, uh, basal bark treatments on maples, beaches. Um, I think it was just primarily maples and beaches that we were doing it on. Thin bark trees that do not tolerate fire. Um, we were working to kill those off. We didn't cut them, we just did basal bark. That way you'd have the tree still standing, uh, providing roosting cavities for bats, um, mm -hmm. birds. Uh, also, you're gonna get a lot of insects coming in as that tree dies. Um, all the insects can be really good for uh, wildlife through there. And then we did one prescribed burn two years ago. Um, and again, that did a great job of knocking back some of those uh, thinned bark trees, but we had a lot of root sprouts. We're hoping to follow it up again with another burn um, this coming spring. Um, and like I said, Swanet Sunflower is just about 500 feet down the road. We're really hoping it's in the seed bank there. Now we'll see, uh, we'll see more um, of these native plants coming up. Um, but again, this, the, the, the project is not possible just by ourselves. It takes a group, it takes partners. Um, at Red Layer, we partner with the Plant Conservation Program uh, to do prescribed fires out there. Um, at the uh, Schwannet Sunflower site. They're also really aggressive with the burning program. So they're doing understory burns through hardwood forests and looking at oak regeneration. That's the thing, oak trees, which are extremely important for pollinators. They are a host tree for about three to 400 different pollinating insects. Um, but they need fire for reproduction as well because they need that sunlight hitting the forest floor to get those acorns to uh, germinate. Um, working with Mecklenburg County um, Natural Resources, at Gar Creek. Uh, we have hold conservation easements on the Gar Creek Nature Preserve sites where they have a terrific bird program. Um, and it's also a Schwann and Sunflower recovery site. And even down in Union County, working with Union County Parks and Rec at Cane Creek Park, they have a five acre Schwann and Sunflower recovery site. And we, have, we hosted a work day with them last year because um, they had a lot of sweet gum seedlings starting to invade. So we went out there and started clipping sweet gum saplings out because they hadn't burned in about seven years. Uh, now they're starting to reintroduce fire at that site as well. Um, working with partners, it's important for partners to do prescribed fire. We are now also, uh, we've worked with enough partners in their region. We have what's called the uh, Catawba Prescribed Burners Association. 
So Mecklenburg County, Foothills Land Conservancy, Catawba Lands Conservancy, we've partnered together to pool resources and um, personnel so we can do more prescribed fires across the region. Um, they'll send work and equipment to help us with our burns, and then we'll also in turn help our partnering agencies with their burns. Um, research, so we, uh, I'm sure many of you here participated in Sun Schwannet Sunflower Counts. Um, again, that's in partnership. There's no way we could count all these Swanet uh, sites without partners and help. Uh, we're also doing pocket prairies. So great example is the Seven Oaks Trail um, in Gaston County down in Belmont. Um, I don't know why we did this, but we did. We went we're with a traditional fescue grass around the parking lot. And then we planted some trees. Um, and that first summer of having to go out there every two weeks and mow the grass, I was like, I got to mow grass in my house. Why are we doing this? <laughs> so um, we applied for a grant with the uh, Gaston County Community Foundation to convert these fescue fields, this fescue uh, lawn area into a pollinator habitat. And so volunteers with Native Plant Society, some of the CLC's volunteers as well came out. Um, we killed off all the fescue grass, went back and planted plugs um, about five or six different species and then mulched over the, and then we mulched them. This was a result after that first year. Yeah. So, um, a couple lessons learned with this though. So this was the first time we did a pocket prairie where we killed all the grass and then planted plugs and then mulched them. I thought that's how you garden. Um, <laughs> the second year we did another pocket prairie, um, and I took a different approach. We, we still killed, killed off the, all the grass. It was really rocky soil. Actually, used to be an old landscaping site. So we were like finding plastic pots and stuff in there. So we ordered um, uh, two truckloads of topsoil and had just buried it all with topsoil um, and then seeded it with a native seed blend and then put a light layer of um, straw mulch over the top of it just to hold that seed in place. Um, so the picture there on the right is beautiful, but the problem is those are only two species and they're summer species, purple cone flower, black-eyed Susans. So what happened about a month later? It was dead. We had some really happy goldfinches. We had some wonderfully happy goldfinches. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just, it all, it all seeded and died back. Yes. So when you have these little pocket prairies, do you maintain those with fire or do you mow them? How do you, what's the process for these pocket prairies? I am trying to get us to the point where we can mow them, or sorry, burn them. Because, it, it, and we actually do that at my house. Mandy doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, the few years that we've been maintaining right now, yeah, it's just through, uh, primarily through mowing. Uh, and actually, I mean, um, at Seven Oaks, we, we left everything because you need to leave those for the birds, goldfinches and all the other uh, winter birds. Um, already I'm seeing dark-eyed juncos in our area now. Yeah. Um, and so we got to leave the seed heads. I'm an advocate for not cleaning up until uh, late winter, early spring. But yeah, so we at Seven Oaks, we had poor diversity. It was looked really great for about a month or two. And after that, it all just went um, So at Far Yarns Preserve Trail, that's where we went with a seed blend. And it looks a lot better. And it holds that color from about late March all the way through October, have diversity in color, diversity in structure. So I'm really a fan for these pocket prairie uh, pollinator habitats um, of using seed blends with some initial plantings of plugs, just so you have that, that initial flush of flowers because the public still wants to see wildflowers. They don't want to wait two or three years. Mm -hmm. um, but you notice I call them pollinator habitats and not pollinator gardens. And I do that intentionally. So if I call them a pollinator garden, people are going to expect mulch beds, isolated plants, and a very meticulous and manicured look. Call them pollinator habitats because that's what they are. We are doing a habitat here, not a garden. Are they only native? The, the wildflower blend that you put, is it only native? Yes. Um, so I give, public? what's that? Is it available to the public? Yes, it is. Um, we normally get our seeds either from Ernst seed or uh, Roundstone seed. Um, there's two other companies that are good. Uh, Mellow Marsh Farm has a seed blend and Garrett Seed, I think is another company that sells seed blends. Uh, Roundstone though, I know that the public can order it. You can order little one ounce packages even if you wanted to. 
Um, some of their seed blends have, are I would say like 95% native and then a very small percent of naturalized plants. I think some of them might include um, like oxide daisy, the white daisy, um, but nothing that's invasive or, or known to be invasive. So um, yeah, they tend to be really good seed blends. Um, yep, yeah, and I think this is just, I got to do it, it's my little sales pitch. But if you are if you love this project or interested in supporting Catawba, uh, the Catawba Grasslands project, you know, your donations can matter. It takes about $1,000 to do a prescribed burn. Um, trading invasive species, we got to do that. Johnson grass and thistle. Um, wildflower seed blends, they can be expensive, but it's worth it. Um, it's about, a the seed blend that I like, because it has the most diversity, is about $180 to $100 per pound and the seed blend or the seed recommendation is about 10 pounds per acre. So it can be expensive to seed large areas. But thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any other questions. So when you were converting and, and starting up uh, and, and seeding, you said you, you had to get rid of the grass that was there. Yes. How did you get rid of it? Did you scrape it off? Did you you burned it? Did you just leave it there? No, so we, we do use herbicide. Okay. Uh, we were, yeah, in that case, we did use uh, Roundup. Okay. Um, we avoid scraping or tilling because what that will do is that anything that's in that seed bank is just going to turn that up and release it, um, especially along that. The Stanley Creek Forest right away is a roadside okay. right away. Okay. Um, so you have no idea what people have been moving up and down that road. Um, so yeah, so we, we, we do use Roundup but it's judiciously, we're not out there every single year applying pounds and pounds per acre. But um, just, I'm at a point where I got the Roundup, all the Roundup killed all the grass and yeah. everything like that. So I don't know what the next steps are. Do I just put soil on top of that and then plant the seed, bugs, et cetera, or? Yeah. So if you've already killed off the grass, um, you could seed right now. Actually, this is the perfect, we got probably about another couple weeks window where seeding would be good. Okay. Um, because what that's going to do is it's going to get you through that winter stratification. Okay. Um, many of our native seeds, they need that winter stratification. Uh, I know people like to buy them at Lowe's and they put them out in the spring and they get nothing because it's got to wait that whole summer to get cold and wet. So right now is the time to seed if you want to go the seeding route. So do I seed right on top of the, the killed grass or? You can't, I... how big of an area are you talking? My whole front yard. Your whole front yard? Yeah. If you, yeah um, if you have the equipment, you might want to consider uh, maybe running a uh, aerator through there, a little thing that pulls the plugs up, or raking it even just to break that soil up. You do want to get that soil to break up a little bit, okay. um, or yeah, or yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. The other thing, yeah. <laughs> maybe a small amount of topsoil. You could even. I've tried it. Like if I know it's, if we had a good rain coming, I'd go out there the day before, okay. get it out there and let the rain pound it into the soil. But you need to have soil. You don't want to put it in the soil. You want to put that seed on the soil and have good soil contact. If you bury, if it even just a quarter inch of, of soil over the top of these seeds, and they're just going to sit there because they yeah. need that sunlight to germinate. How long do you have to wait for the roundup? Uh, probably two weeks, I'd say. Yeah, two to three weeks should be good. Yes. How do how well do uh, grasslands do carbon sequestration as opposed to trees? Because you know that's what commonly everybody knows is you got to yes. plant lots of trees. Thank you for that question. So she asked, um, how do grasslands compare with carbon sequestration to forest canopy? Um, if I have my notes with me, it is a study out of Davidson, uh, out of Davis, California. So different than our region. But it actually showed that grasslands sequestered more carbon than forests did. Because so much of that carbon for, gra for our grassland plants is in the roots. And we're talking with some of our native grasses, um, big blue stem, those roots go down six, eight, ten feet deep. Even in the clay? Even in the clay, yeah. And so, you know, with a lot of our trees, most of their carbon is, is sequestered in the bark. Um, the leaves are still going to break down and then re-release their carbon. So it's carbon neutral, but most of it is just in the bark. But for a lot of our grassland plants, it's all in the in the roots and gets stuck in the soil. Yeah. Do we know whether or not the the notice the 
historical noticing of documentation, um, could these grasslands all have been just succession that hasn't happened yet? Like, in other words, do we know that they stayed grasslands, you know, for a long time, yeah. or were they just the result of a fire and people saw them before the succession happened? That's a great question. So it's, um, are grasslands permanent situations, or is it just areas that hadn't succeeded yet? Um, and the reality is, yes, they they were always in flux. Our landscape has always been in flux. It's always been a mosaic of grasslands, wooded uh, forest, deeply wooded ravines and hillsides. Um, and so it's very possible that, yes, yeah, some of these grasslands may have occurred uh, because of a fire. Succession came in. They forced, you know, they returned back to a forest state but then you would have had another fire come through. Right. And so it was always in flux. No, it's not like this hilltop has always been a grassland and this ravine has always been forested, but it's always as fire moved through. And um, yeah, it makes me think of something, I was at Red Layer a couple of years ago. So I hear a lot of times people talk about fires, uh, our fire regime was from one of two methods, either um, indigenous people uh, intentionally lighting fires for um, to create great hunting grounds and also for agriculture. But the other has always been said to be lightning strikes. And it seemed odd to me, it's like, well, lightning comes with rain. You can't have fire and rain at the same time. I was at Red Layer um, this past winter and storm came through, lightning hit a tree, split the tree, blew, the, I mean, the tree blew up and then we had a big rain. Went out there three days later and that tree trunk was smoldering. It's not that the lightning caused the fire, but that lightning let, caught that tree, it smoldered. And if you just waited a few more days for it to dry up, that smoldering tree would have ignited the leaves on the forest floor. And then you would have had that fire go through. Um, and so if you think about how parcelized our landscape is now, everyone owns their one acre, everyone owns their half acre. Well, I don't want your fire on your half acre to get to my one acre, or your fire in your 10 acres to get on my 50 acres. So we got to put fires out. Forest service, um, Early on, they had a um, policy to have any fire put out by 10 a.m. the next morning, no matter what. They didn't care how many fire lines they had to put in, how much water they were going to have that fire out by 10 a.m. the next morning. Imagine letting those fires run across landscapes now. A low intensity fire right after after a rain. Um, that's that's the type of fire that we're talking about here in the region. So. At that point, um, just I, I came from a family of firefighters. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things we noticed too is that the fire can go into the duck. Yes. So even though it's pouring on top, we would see a week later another fire pop up someplace else because it travels through the dry but, duck if you've got years and years of absolutely. Up. Um and it we had one near my barn one time and it took us like three weeks to finally completely knock it down. Yeah. Absolutely. We have some questions in the Zoom chat. Okay. Um, if uh, so, one person's working and they're three years into a wildflower area that's about a thousand square feet, uh, and they are, are wondering, uh, or 10,000 square feet actually, oh, uh, looking yeah. um, at invasives, things like Creeping Charlie, um, and wondering if, if they should leave it or if they should really try to rip all that out or if, if the native plants can maybe take over or what do you suggest? Um. Creeping Charlie is a difficult one. I would I would probably probably rip out the Creeping Charlie just because with a lot of our native plants, they are grassland plants. They're going to set their seed and they got to sit on the soil. So if you have a whole bed of Creeping Charlie, it doesn't really provide a lot of opportunity for those seeds to get that soil contact. I'd probably try to remove the Creeping Charlie. Um, I've also distinguished between um, invasive and naturalized. So if I have a pollinating habitat and I get oxide daisy in there, um, I'm not going to worry about that. If I get dandelions in it, I'm not going to worry about it because they're not going to, they're going to play well with the other plants. They're not going to outcompete it. But yeah, if I have things like Johnson grass, creeping Charlie, um, thistle, then those are the things I'm going to absolutely try to eradicate. And how do, you, how do you go about eradicating creeping Charlie? Um, you can hand pull it. Um, I know there's different saying of pins on here, so I'm just giving mine. Um, I don't know the, the formulation, but I'm sure someone can find it, but you can actually use borax, um, like the, the, the box that you buy for your laundry detergent. 
um, it is sensitive to borax, so you can actually use that. Um, so like, yeah, wouldn't it destroy? It kills bugs too. It kills yeah. bugs too. Yeah. Well, then don't do that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> destroy everything in the soil under too. You nematodes, probably the snail. Okay, good to know. Yeah, don't do that then. Okay. Keep doing. Very good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think with Creep and Charlie Hampel, it might respond. It might respond negatively to fire. Um, so we've we actually have a small pollinator habitat at our house. It's rock. It's ringed with rock. Um, the kids love it, so we'll go out. I'll go out there at the uh, end of the winter with a just a big lighter and because I've got some grasses in there. That's the important thing with these pollinator habitats, by the way, is grass. You absolutely have to include grass. Um, things nest in that grass, but it also provides the structure that holds up your flowers. Mm -hmm. Without it, my black eyed Susans, which get this tall, would just flop over every year. But as soon as I put in some um, little blue stem. And Virginia, not Virginia rye, well, Virginia rye is a good one, but um, switchgrass, uh, Virginia switchgrass. Love grass. Love grass, yeah, molly grass, that's a wonderful, I love molly grass. Um, that helps to provide structure for all these wildflowers to lean on and pack them in tight. You gotta pack these wildflowers in tight because just like with a forest canopy, all the trees help to support each other, same with these wildflowers, they're all there to help support each other as well. Um, but with those grasses, just a little bit lighter, get the grass going. It burns through quick. I'm talking with about five to 10 minutes. It's over. The fire department can't even think to respond before, it, <laughs> before the fire is out. Um, but what that does then with the Creeping Charlie, especially that heat, Creeping Charlie does not like fire. It's not going to do well with that heat. It'll burn it up. That's, that might be a method. Yeah. And when, if you're using fire, what, what kind of time of year do you recommend? Um... There's all types of time of year you can do it. Um, for like small little pockets, right now is a, well, not right now because we're under a burn ban, but <laughs> fall or spring are good times. I would probably recommend a, a late winter to early spring. Um, yeah, that, that's what I recommend, Megan. And you had mentioned um, you had mentioned when you go through and you do your bush hog, you know, you're chopping that. Yep. Um, that I think you guys are going and doing it at the end of fall. But you were saying you kind of recommend going through and, and clearing out things uh, end of spring, late winter. Is there a reason you guys do it in the fall? Uh, with the bush hogging, um, I think we're doing it in fall just because that's um, we still need to use farmers for that. Mm -hmm. So if we try to do it in the spring, they're trying to get crops in the ground. Right now is a lull time that like, okay, yeah, we, we can come out there and you, let you use the equipment. Um, one thing I would keep in mind, and this is with bush hogging, or if you're just, you know, as you're cleaning up your gardens, um, I personally do not clean the garden again, because I want to leave all those seed heads for all the wintertime birds. But if you're someone who just, oh, I, I got to have a clean garden, that's fine. Um, if you do it with natives though, cut them about six to eight inches off the ground. Leave that stubble because that stubble is extremely important for our ground nesting and um, bees and not ground nesting, but a lot for a lot of our native bumblebees. They will actually lay their eggs in early spring in those tubes, in those hollowed stems. So you leave six to eight inches of stubble that provides habitat or that provides a place for our pollinating insects to deposit their eggs for the following year. So um, help, help me understand that again. Yes. You said in the spring, cut it down to eight inches. Actually, right. You could do it right now. Okay. I would do it right now. Cut it so there's about six to eight inches of stubble. Okay. And because what's going to happen then is the following spring, your pollinating insects, especially a lot of our bumblebees, they're going to emerge. And then shortly after, they'll deposit eggs in that stubble. Okay. And that stubble, they'll pupate throughout the, the growing season. They'll be ready for next year. You can basically do that any time between you now can. and the beginning of April. You could. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I'm just thinking about right now because some people like to clean their gardens up so they don't have a whole bunch of dead, dead heads all through the winter time. And the yeah. stubble also catches a lot of the leaves, which then become your um, fertilizer. Yeah. And nutrients for next year. So I yeah, so that's that's what I mean. I wait until the birds wipe out the top and then sometimes um you know I'll cut it. There you go. Yeah. Or even if you cut it, um will they will they also nest in um pieces that aren't attached to anything? Like if you cut the top and you lie it down among I don't know if they would, but maybe I'd just be worried about it blowing around um, and moving like, around. Like poke them into the oh, there you go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what that also does, um, I've heard is that. When you have all that layer, 
if we get snow again, um, it holds the snow up just above the ground and actually insulates those basal rosettes. Yeah. Ellie's. Well, Lynn had a question first, and then I. Oh, okay. Oh, I was just gonna when you did your donation page. I know in the past, Brad Financial has offered matching. Yes. On the Tuesday after. We will have a match. Yes. yes. So yeah, I just want everybody to know that. That can, you can go Monday. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Giving Tuesday after Thanksgiving, we'll have a match available. So if you want to make a donation to the project, it'll get matched. So thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, so the Jackson, what is that called? Jackson Blackjack. Okay. And that's down Potter Road. Potter Road. And is it 601? I think down that way. 200? Yeah, 200. Probably 200. Yeah, I think okay. it's 200. Yeah. No, um, okay, but you know, I think you know that I wander around. <laughs> really? <laughs> like for way 75. Yeah. I, you know, okay. I mean, there's tons of cool stuff there. And DOT is supposed to manage, but they don't really. Yeah. And I mean, there are populations there. And so I guess I'm wondering if, if any of the right of way. I don't know. Is there is there any hope, Sean? <laughs> it's, it's it's difficult. Um, I mean, it worked really well with Duke Energy because we had buy-in from the right-of-way manager, and we met with him and had him come out and, and talked about it. Um, I know with DOT they use so much. It's the same with Duke, but with DOT they're using so many contractors. I think. Yes. Um, I don't know. You know, I don't I don't know if it matters. If you saw on our no mo no spray signs. It was in English and Spanish. Yeah. Um, don't know if that's contributed, but we have not had a problem yet. I mean, I've seen them run down the no spray no mess up. One of mine is hit and bent. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I guess, um, I don't know, because you know, just, there really are so many species there. And I, I don't know, uh, well, and we also have whatever the other energy company is. Uh, they're overlapping. Yeah. The, the, uh, you know, Union Power and Union Power. Yeah. Like not a friend for wildflowers so far that I could tell. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I can talk about it. But I mean, you know, it's just. We could just try to see if there's. Mm -hmm. You could try to see if there's more coal ash or feed and all of the other stuff. So they're trying to. But I mean, they're doing all the bad stuff. I don't think you can be a candidate for just if they had a more general, you know, yeah. uh, management program like that. Because I mean, that's. That's for a bunch of them. It, it is. And actually, Jackson Blackjack got hit as well. I went out the fall. That first year, I found the uh, barb button so excited. And then went back out there the next year and it had been sprayed. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so the best we can hope for is, at least on that particular site, that the work that we're doing off the roadside, hopefully, what was on that roadside seed bank is also in that forested seed bank. Working with land, you know, maybe that's the thing is to work with landowners on those roadsides and see, hey, DOT is going to manage this 10 to 15 feet. Do you want to do something on the next 15 to 20 feet? Um, but will the DOT to... stop on there? Oh, they will. Yeah, they, they would. They would stop there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what do you recommend if people are putting down seed now um, to use as mulch? You, know, you mentioned straw, but is there anything else you'd recommend? Um, I, I would actually recommend at all. If possible, not to mulch at all. Mm -hmm. um, especially like in your case where it's uh, you already had grass and a thatch layer, just put the seed directly over into that. Have a good rain to water it in. Uh, the other reason that I use mulch on our project is because we put down fresh topsoil. Um, and so there was nothing um, to prevent birds from coming in and just picking it right off that mm -hmm. nice soft plate that we provided for them. Yeah. Uh, but no, generally speaking, um, our native seeds don't need to be mulched, and it's actually preferred not to mulch a native uh, native bed. Yeah, I've also learned personally that sorry, with mulching, that um, when you want something to naturalize, it won't. Right. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, and that's actually another lesson we learned at Seven Oaks is uh, we put down a really thick layer of mulch because I thought that's that's how you garden, yeah. um, and it did a terrific job of keeping out weeds, but we also had no. Um, reproduction yeah. because the seeds just laid on top of that mulch mm -hmm. rather than on the soil. So it actually inhibited our efforts there.
I've noticed recently um, when we get bales of straw to use as mulch, we've got a couple of invasive grasses that are yes. um, really yeah. coming yeah. along with those a lot lately. Mm -hmm. um, Japanese stilt grass is mm -hmm. one that comes with that. And then the other one is a species of abena um, that flowers and, and um, seeds really early in the season. So okay. um, if you have a, you know, a tall grass, um, that really shoots up really quickly in the spring and, and flowers. Um, yeah, you need yeah. to get rid of that. That's the, um, the I mean, that species that yeah. makes it. If I have to use something, so the, there is a difference between hay and wheat straw. Okay. And it's hay that generally comes with those weeds. I'm not saying wheat straw doesn't, yeah. but... I've gotten this from wheat straw that I've gotten from yeah. those. I was, I was going to say, wheat straw is not, a, is not immune to it, but wheat straw, if I have to choose one, I will take wheat straw because it's less likely. Not immune from it, but less likely. There's a huge yeah. difference between hay and straw. It Some is. People don't realize one's food, one's a bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But either one is going to come with with uh, weedy seeds in it too, unfortunately. What were some of the grasses you mentioned introducing? I know you mentioned love grass, mealy grass, switchgrass. Yeah. Um. So, uh, switchgrass, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, which is another great one to use in landscaping. Uh, molly grass, which I think is the same as love grass, although it could be no, different, you know, different things. Okay. Okay. So molly grass and love grass. Um, our, we have a native plume grass, um, long on plume grass, which actually you see a lot of along the roadside right now, uh, which I wish was used more often, um, is another uh, great one to include. Mm -hmm. Yeah, grass. So uh, blue blue stem. What's that? Woolly blue stem. Is that one of the? Is that a native? Woolly blue stem. Yeah. So yeah. Once you get into the blue stems, now you've got you've got lots of ones. Yeah. Woolly blue stem, split beard, um, little blue stem, big blue stem. Uh, yeah. Well, no more questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you. Thank Dan, you so much. Thank you.